And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us all the, coming to us all the way from Fearsome Games, and the creators, uh, and one of the creators of old school wizardry, the nine ancient runes of magic, the one and only Jarrett Perdue. How are you doing tonight, man? I'm absolutely swell. Really glad to be on. Thanks for having me. Thanks for thanks for coming on and braving the nightmare of time zones to come to come on. <laughs> um, so it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, as it were. With that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm glad you asked. Uh, I was Mildra at about the tender age of seven, um, the first time that I wielded a 20-sider in anger. Uh, so it was a uh, it was a poo brown 20-sider that came in the 81 Mold Bay basic set. Mm -hmm. And man, it looked like something that came out of an archaeological dig. It was... Uh, almost completely illegible. Uh, we we never used the crayon that came with the set to go ahead and fill in the numbers. Oh God, and the so, crayon! <laughs> right. And so the uh, the edges, the, the plastic was so soft that the corners got wonderfully rounded, and it was already a bit smaller than the kind of standard D20s that we pick up in a hobby shop, brick and mortar today. Mm -hmm. So this sucker became virtually round pretty quickly. Still have it. It's still on my shelf. Still use it once in a while, but. Um, it was just, it was like an artifact from another civilization to hold those those funky dice in my hands. And then we rolled into storytelling. My first DM was my older brother. He's older than me by four years. And my, my first teammate was my mom. And so, you know, kind of sitting around the coffee table there in our little old house uh, on the farm in, in Virginia, we started our first adventure. And he used parts of the Keep on the Borderlands and the Caves of Chaos to kind of walk us through. But um, my brother, honestly, he, he didn't have a whole lot of idea what he was doing, and we had even less. Um, I, I rolled up two characters, and uh, so here's, here comes a seminal moment, right? In Mulvey Basic in, in 81, when you're rolling your stats, you're determining what characters you have the option to play. It's, it's not, you know, Kenny Wumpus where you decide in your mind, okay, I'm going to, you know, be this kind of caster or I've got this picture of an awesome hero in my mind and I'm going to play that and we'll, we'll roll some dice in the middle. Instead, the dice inform what your options are. So I end up playing uh, a halfling, bold, grim, and, and like kind of uh, tight with his words, uh, taciturn little halfling, and uh, to round out the party because there was only two players. Also a thief, because that's the only thing that that character could qualify for. And remember, you rolled your stats in order down the line. So there, there was, uh, while Moldvay had an option for some shuffling of points, uh, you, you would kind of bleed a point or you'd be taxed some points as you moved those around. Mm -hmm. So really, you know, rolling what you had and sticking with it, that was, that was kind of the name of the game. My mom had a, a, a greedy dwarf and I believe a fighter as well. Though, like I said, that's, this is back in 81, so... Memory's a little fuzzy on that. Mm -hmm. My um, my brother took us through this dungeon, and uh, Mildred, I got I got to tell you, it was um, it, it looked a lot less like Conan and a lot less like anything out of Lord of the Rings. And what it probably resembled the most to you know little seven year old me was the movie Aliens. Um, I you know I don't know where he kind of struck at that for inspiration, but every single doorway we were terrified that there was going to be green slime just on the other side of it that would drop on your character's head and you'd be dead. Just bang. Now it didn't happen, but mm -hmm. that didn't keep us from being scared to death, right? Like every single doorway we're poking with the 10 foot pole. We're looking, um, skeletons. It, it, you might not know this little detail. You might, I don't know. You've, you've got a, an encyclopedic knowledge of this stuff, but back in, uh, in mold Bay basic, mm -hmm. there's one little throwaway line that, uh, undead, don't make any noise. So you've got your thief listening at the door. Sounds quiet. You don't know if there's a half dozen skeletons on the other side of that door. It's a funny little feature from the old days of D&D of that simply since then it's kind of been stripped away. But 
I was just completely paranoid that there'd be skeletons lurking around every corner and they were going to get us, right? And, and like for a seven-year-old where you've got maybe a little bit of Jason in the Argonauts, mm -hmm. uh, maybe some Fantasia under your belt, and like that's your frame of reference for skeleton. These dudes are scary. I mean, this is, this is nightmare fuel right here. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that, suffice to say, we only played a couple of sessions, but that made a big impression. There's some serious grooves in my, my little kid brain that I've been uh, working on filling ever since. Um, that was some of my earliest impressions. My mom went on to run a couple more sessions after that. And uh, gosh, all these years later, I could still remember the plot. I could still remember where we stopped and what wasn't resolved. And even like the anxiety over what's the rest of the story and, and remind me later on in the, um, in our talk and our time together to come back to that idea of like the story that doesn't quite get finished because it's something that I addressed in old school wizardry. It was an important part of the design to me. So, uh, and, and jump in here if you need to, but mm -hmm. after that, I did what a lot of players did and I bridged from Molve 81, you know, what do you need if you've had a heady draft of that kind of nightmare fuel? Well, you need more monsters, of course. Mm -hmm. So my next stop on my role-playing tour was uh, about 1984 was the Monster Manual, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Monster Manual. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact that this is theoretically a separate game line, um, you know, was it lost on me? Yeah, but even the extent to which I understood that, you know, that's not going to keep you from integrating these fascinating, terrifying, and in some cases, like named and really personal monsters into your world. So, you know, Tiamat, yeah, sign me up. Like the first adventure that I ran that featured Tiamat as a, as a villainess, um, gosh, I was still in elementary school. Uh, granted, the party never actually encountered her, but it was the lurking fear that she was somewhere nearby, uh, drips of water falling on the, the bottom of an old barrel that they thought was the sound of her her tread, her footsteps coming near, some false rumors to get them super keyed up. And I ended up playing with some of those guys all the way through into uh, into high school. So I, I know that it was some, some serious uh, visceral experience for them, too. Mm -hmm. um, from those products, you know, okay, more monsters, you know, do I understand what percent in layer means yeah not really you know mention of psionics mm, okay no we're just going to hand wave that does the orc armor class quite match up no but you know what as a, as a 10 year old by that point i could figure out how to integrate this stuff i could figure out how to make it work right i mean the, the mere fact that the the dessert line in the buffet is, is a little bit longer it doesn't mean like well i'm gonna skip the dessert line no you, you're gonna go after the good stuff with all the gusto that that kids just naturally have mm -hmm. so we're gonna integrate those monsters every last one and we're gonna use them except for the, the morgoth I, I don't know what it was with gary and aquatic monsters and frog dudes he had way way too many frog dudes but anyway um after after kind of sewing in some more AD&D, stitching in character classes uh, my brother and thank you again to my my brother out there uh, bought me a tattered, battered old issue of Dragon Magazine. Uh, cover was torn, had an article about Hades in it. Um, that was just an aftershock to the initial explosion that was D and D in my consciousness. Because I'm like, oh, oh, okay. You know, the idea that I might be limited at all by what was in the book, that went completely out the window. Um, Dragon Magazine was like, okay, you don't have to be Gary Gygax. You could be any of these people listed here on the table of contents to generate content and tell great stories and start adding new classes and spells. And so that just started a, a love affair with tinkering around with the content um, from, from AD&D content. I ended up adding Star Frontiers and then Gamma World, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and other strangenesses by the time I was in middle school. Um, some brief flirtations with, with Battletech. Uh, Ghostbusters. Do you remember the um, Western Games Ghostbusters? Oh yeah, oh yeah. And I've um, <laughs> if, if you do, if you go if you go back a little bit in my in my archives, um, yeah. I cover I I briefly touched on um, touched on Ghostbusters now touched on Ghostbusters West End now both um both the fact that it started out with the whole frightfully cheerful, which right. arguably is one of the first um, cases of a die pool system. Yes, that's it, yes. Um, and, but I will I will admit that I spent more time with um, Ghostbusters International than I did with Frightfully okay. Cheerful. <laughs> no, you you uh, you highlighted the die pool mm -hmm. system, and that's 
I mean, wow, you just put your finger right on the pulse mm -hmm. of some of what's happening inside of old school wizardry. And I, and I hope you made that connect yeah. when you were looking the game over. I but, did. Yeah, <laughs> that's the DNA right there. I, I would later meet Dipool um, as I got into high school, moved through some, you know, Robotech, uh, Star Wars. So I encountered Dipool there again. At Marvel Super Heroes Advanced um, was was a big influence. And then over into Shadowrun, um, Tales of the Floating Vagabonds, uh, Elf Quest, Twerps, which mm -hmm. was another kind of revelation that, hey, hey maybe we don't need 90% of the rule book anyway. Um, you know, because to have a good time with Twerps, I don't know if you've ever come across that particular one. Um, White Wolf, uh, Vampire and Werewolf. Yeah. And uh, Call of Cthulhu was another revelation in college um, in terms of tone mm -hmm. and storytelling. Uh, Fairy Queen and Country was was brilliant, so I, yeah. I encountered that about that time. And then uh, GURPS, Earth Dawn, and King Arthur Pendragon um, once I was out of college, which was probably my last, my, my latest huge shock um, in terms of, you know, formative uh, encounters with, with role playing. Yeah. So I think those are, <laughs> maybe I killed your question, but um, I think oh, that's as short an answer as I can give you. Oh, no, you gave me, you gave me exactly what I, what I was looking for with this kind of thing. And you, you get, I, and I appreciate getting, getting more than getting more than the usual because a lot of times when I bring this when I bring this kind of thing up, whether whether I'm talking with people at my LGS or at cons or the like, they usually begin and end with just the with just the first game that they um, that they play that they play D DM'd mm -hmm. or what have you. Um, but a lot of the time, I look at game I look at somebody's game design approaches as kind of as kind of a journey. Um, yeah. You started out with one thing, then you expand, then you have a certain thing that you want that you want to do that's not being done elsewhere, and you decide, well, if you want something done, you got to do it yourself, and <laughs> that and that's how it goes. Um, You're right. Now with old school wizardry, which I'm sure, which um, I appreciate the adding the adding of the e. <laughs> oh, um, there's a story behind that, but <laughs> maybe we'll have time. Yeah. Um, when I look at when I look at this sort of th when I look at this sort of thing, the emphasis on on characters being these being these low level kind of wizards with a with a dash of Brit of um very British humor. <laughs> yes. Um, oddly enough, one one of the games that I that I ended up being reminded of, especially when I looked into the magic system that you have, mm -hmm. was okay. Ars Magica, and I'm curious okay. if that was. An influence for you at an, at any point in time, or if that's um, me reading into a coincidence. I've um, I've never played, run, read, or purchased um, Ars Magica. I saw it in a um, hobby store called Hungates down in Chesapeake, Virginia, mm -hmm. um, a couple of years. Like, gosh, that's been twenty years ago, probably. If it's if it's that old, but um, I, it was published by White Wolf. At the time, yes, it's currently published by Atlas. Okay. Um, no, I, I am not familiar with with Ars Magica. What's it? What's it about? Uh, Ars Ars Magica is first off, it it is it is a very um, medieval European ap approach. It's not doing the qua it's not doing the quasi medieval that you see a lot of um, <laughs> fantasy games go with. Um, what has been lovingly "Quote unquote," nicknamed in the house at in my house as the Tolkien melting pot. Okay. Um, it describes itself as a as a um, um like I was going to say a passion play, but that's more fate. That's more fading suns. One of the things that it does emphasize is the idea of um playing multiple playing multiple um characters. And okay. there is a strong emphasis on a mix and match attitude when it comes to spell creation and use. That was okay. the, that was the reason why I had why I had that connective tissue, and I wondered if um, something like Ars Magica was an it was an influence. Although Ars Magica is significantly more crunchy than what you're shooting for. Okay, hmm. it's it sounds like something worth checking out. Um, I like the. Um, stepping away from Tolkien pastiche, I, I think that uh, a Tolkien setting uh, can be really fierce and really engaging. But I, and this is funny, but I don't think we've seen many Tolkien 
settings in print um, that that capture that world. I think instead there's a. Uh, I hope I don't <laughs> hurt some feelings, but I think we've seen some warmed over pap, which is uh, you know a, a Tolkien esque um, kind of kind of reprocessed. Um, Look, don't worry about hurting people's feelings on this. We tell <laughs> we tell the truth here in the temple, no matter how bad it hurts. Yeah, I um I was I was mentioning to somebody the other day when I when I think about Tolkien, uh, one of the first characters that pops into mind is the Elvin Smith who lived alone in his cave um, and forged a, a blade out of star metal mm -hmm. um, and uh, ab abducted a noble of another house and. Uh, kept her prisoner. Uh, eventually, she bore a child by him. So uh, we've we've got you know okay, folks who think they know Tolkien's elves is like okay. Well, inside of that, do you have uh, these pale loner, uh, cursed sword swinging um, abductors? Because uh, you've got to have room in there. And my goodness, Feanor, um, as as far as kinslaying goes, and uh, the unbridled you know Achilles level. Of um, of arrogance that mm -hmm. kind of drives his arc. Um, I, I think people maybe aren't as familiar with Tolkien as they think they are. <laughs> so, um, but but uh, that's. Uh, well, I, I think um, well, mm -hmm. I a few months back I did a I did a series where I looked into a bunch of a bunch of um, Tolkien RP, a bunch of um, Tolkien esque RPGs mm -hmm. over over the course of a few weeks. You know, start starting with Merp since that since that's the patient yeah. zero, and going all the way up to the rec to um the most recent one, which was the One Ring. Um, okay. And I'd say I'd say a ma I'd say a major I'd say a major problem with try with trying to do Tolkien in in an RPG, and I do want to make clear that the whole Tolkien melting pot isn't referring to Tolkien in general, but more of the broad pastiche that get that gets a little yeah. bit overused. Where people are yes. using fantasy motifs, but they don't know why. Um, right. But the big pro the big problem is a lot of people, both both fans, players, DMs, and designers, I think focus on the wrong thing. They focus more on tr on trying to on trying to get to the on trying to get the setting right. Mm -hmm. Rather than rather than providing a sandbox to do things with it, because are you familiar with are you familiar with the term continuity lockout? Uh, talk to me. Break it down. For it's me. it's basic. It's basically a lex. It's basically a lexicon th thing where the, where there's so where there's so much and there's so much um, detail within co within continuity that um, <laughs> tr that trying to approach it can be too intimidating. Um, you have the <laughs> forgotten <it's> a, realms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For, um, and as much as much as I, as much as Legend of the Five Rings is one of my favorite settings, it's guilty as this as well. And um, <laughs> I'm still, I will still never be a hundred percent comfortable talking about BattleTech without or Traveler without yeah. worried that I'm going to say something that's going to show <sighs> my ass. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, Star Wars. I I trip over the same issue with Star Wars um, yeah. sometimes, but no, I I that's a that's a good phrase, and I understand exactly what you mean. Yeah, but now, and I, and because of the because of the fact that's that there's th that there's this fixation on tr on trying to get on trying to quote unquote get Tolkien right, they yeah. miss out the point that um, the person who's going to be GMing say Merp is not Tolkien. Mm -hmm. The person who's going right. to be GMing a Song of Ice and Fire RPG is not George R. R. Martin. Thank God. Right. <laughs> um, the person who's going to be GMing um, old school wizardry potentially is not Jer is not Jarrett Perdue. Yes, sir. And you need and I th and a lot of and you need to have an emphasis on this is a this is a set this is a sandbox for for you to build right. your castle in. This is right. a bucket of Legos for you to freestyle. Right. I'm I'm glad you made that point. Uh... Mildred, and in fact, that's something I wanted to make sure we we talked about mm -hmm. during our time together, because um, I I hope that you could see as as you were getting familiar with old school wizardry, what was happening with implied setting versus overt setting. Yeah. Um. So in the in the first sixty pages, without any exposition on them, 
you learn that there's land piranha and something called a flatware golem mm -hmm. and that uh, slavers are apparently thing uh an animated privy and um you know fish people degenerate fish people are a thing apparently in this world but none of those ideas are developed anywhere else in the text and that's that was really a choice on our part um it's it's that take you know take yourself back to your first encounter with for me it was star wars mm -hmm. uh where you see that lived in world you hear mention made of cities and towns and wars that never get further developed in that first film instead your imagination locks in and engages with them and you're like uh what is that about and it creates depth and reality and i want to make space for the game master for her to do that for him to do that and to and to really build out their world without feeling like they've got to try to fit in my smelly and awkward overshoes right like that's god what a, what a burden as a, as a dm as a gm you're leaning in and being attentive to your players uh you don't need to be multitasking trying to satisfy the dictates of uh, a writer who you're never gonna probably interact with in addition right that invisible critic sitting at your table that's just going to be a distraction from running the game um and so we, we really tried to, to lean away from that as as hard as we could while planting these like gems of inspiration throughout the text so no matter like how mechanical that section um we we pounded in examples over and over and over again uh examples of of play that just drop these little vignettes, drop these little nuggets, try to do it with humor. Uh, you, you mentioned the Brit humor before, and I'm so glad that you picked up on that. It meant that my writing communicated in the voice that I wanted it to communicate in, because I was, I was writing in character uh, when putting this together. And, uh, and, and hopefully just kind of give that GM the fuel that she needs to just to race ahead with it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I couldn't be more tickled that as, as somebody who hasn't been sitting at the table with us for months and for years, you were able to pull that from the text. That's really gratifying. Yeah. It didn't surprise me when I, when I saw a lot of hints that, that um, old school wizardry is something that was born from a, a, a campaign that you, that you guys were doing for a, for a good length of time that, ju that just mm -hmm. spiraled into its own thing. <laughs> and when... Now, when it comes when it comes to something like imp implied setting, um, yeah. I will admit that this is a very thin tightrope to walk for a for a lot of people, and not a lot of people mm -hmm. get this right. The reason why I pointed out the whole the whole sandbox thing is that there are um, this is a pendulum, and this is a pendulum that swings both ways. On one end of the extreme, you can have too much detail. Yeah. Where you end, where you end up having so many things that happened, that a uh, G, that you don't have enough room f to put out story seeds where, where um, where a prospective table could in could insert the story that they want to tell, yeah. or right. the assumption that both the GM and the players need to have all need to have all this backstory in order to actually play their actually play their characters. Right. On the other hand. Oh. You could have, you could you could have a you could have one that is, that that goes the, that is far too wide where, it where um it's trying to imply a, where it's trying to imply a setting but still having mm -hmm. a set of rules. This is a problem that I've had with um D and D for as long as I can remember. The fact that um D the fact that D and D want um wants to say that it can be that can be used for all the all different types of fantasy. But at the same mm -hmm. time, having all these things that imply a certain setting, and I've often mm -hmm. said, D and D, um, either shit or get off the pot regarding <laughs> what regarding what type of fantasy you are. You can't just say, oh, oh we're a fa oh, we're a fantasy game, because then I have to ask, okay, what kind? Are you high, mm -hmm. low, sword and sorcery, dark, mm -hmm. grim dark? Got to pick one. <laughs> and and uh, though it probably leads us off topic a little bit, that has shifted over time in the history of D and D like significantly. Um, so, so even the answer from decade to decade in as much as we can, we can try to wrestle an answer out of the text. That answer is really different. If you're talking about a J or Combs basic um, versus, well, you know, a third edition player's handbook. Um, we've really walked things to a different place. So it's a moving target too. Even I would, I, um, 
I'd say the the moving target thing is a symptom. Mm-hmm. Um, because of the fact because of the fact that it's that what st- what style was never was never get was never given a hard was never given a hard and fast nailing down of 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 what okay. of what it, of what style it's supposed to be that pe- that people could just as easily si- say oh it's oh it's this or oh, it's this genre or it's, or it's that genre and mm-hmm. the pro- the problem is too too many cooks in the kitchen spoil the broth <laughs> yeah um but when it com- when it comes to when it comes to something like old school wizardry um through both through both the writing and through the through the art um i think it's cl- i think it's clear to see that this leans leans more in the low in the low almost renaissance style of um yes. of fantasy yes um, you nailed it i w- and i say i say low in the in the sense when it com- the difference between high and low for me is al- always comes down to power scaling and mm-hmm. the um range of power that can that can be had with um with ca- with characters mm-hmm. um now one one no, i could no, see one I someone see one. Ar- someone argue that um it lean that it could lean towards sword and sorcery i don't th- i don't think that's the case largely because of the fact that sword that with sword and with something like sword and sorcery um magic is not viewed all that favorably or it's viewed or it's right. viewed as the is viewed as the guy who possibly has a few screws loose and granted mm-hmm. given the kind of humor that you're dealing with old school wizardry wizards <laughs> are going to have a bit of a screw loose as it is sure but it's more but when i say a screw loose it's more ca- it's more a case of yeah, keep keep about five feet away just in case that guy explodes <laughs> or something. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed, you got it. Yeah, the the uh, the slow dramatic lean away from the party member when he um when he starts to try something. <laughs> That's um sorry for the uh, I, don't, I don't usually debauch in, into uh, profanity, but it was really important in game that when we uh, had the characters visiting um, a laboratory in the Collegium Mysterium that you know, that particular campaign's uh, premier school of magic that uh, after a few sessions, a notice was put up in the laboratory of the school that said, no trying shit. <laughs> that was the, you know, so uh, theoretically laboratory is there to, to practice your art and your craft, but um, the, the cleanup had just gotten to be significant enough that, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that became the number one lab rule. Um, so yes, you you uh, you read that correctly, and I and I agree that um, I wouldn't I wouldn't pin it into the swords and sorcery, though. My gosh, you know my my love letters to uh, to like a Moorcock are there. Um, you know Fritz Lieber, but like you know that's I, I love that stuff. I, I think that we do a little bit of a send up on them. Um, you know the the way that you you tease a buddy. Mm-hmm. Um, because there's a there's a purpleness to some of the uh the, some of the scenario seeds in particular um the send up of of lovecraft here and there you, you mentioned the uh, or you notice probably the chi chi versus the the cho cho the um diminutive um bloat art wielding savages that just get mentioned in this one particular example um you know kind of kind of lampooning his approach to the ethnic other as well as um just kind of a nod there um so you know just just kind of shaking our head and having a chuckle um with with elric and, and some of those other figures uh, particularly in the doom of wizards too uh you'll see uh some some gentle and loving send-ups of uh some of our swords and sorcery heroes i think uh, one of our um characters in our epilogue there gets referred to as being mighty food <laughs> which um i don't know where else i've seen that used uh, outside of you know howard maybe Mm-hmm. Um, so, so yes, I, I think you got us pinned down pretty well. Um, and there's social constraints that, you know, while at first blush you go, why aren't these wizards, you know, why aren't we talking super high fantasy godlike powers to just call things into existence ex nihilo? Um, and the answer is there's, there are some, you know, baked in rules constraints. Yes. But there are also a lot of social constraints, um, <laughs> you know, that, uh, and, and that kind of goes to our title, old school wizardry too. Um, because there's there's a lot baked in there. Um, the the idea 
um, much of the stirring for this when it first started percolating um, was was coming to me when I was working in a corporation, and um, that was prior to going over to working in uh, public school, and gosh, looking at how organizations work from the or don't work from the inside. Um, really provided a tremendous amount of inspiration about how you can have uh, really bright, motivated, eager, hungry folks who are not really able to work to their potential, how uh, social constraints get in their way, and how organizations um, really serve organizations. They don't necessarily serve their mission statement, um, but that they really maintain the organization and the status quo. And so there's there's a lot of commentary kind of baked in, and, and I know that sounds maybe a little bit dry, but if we come at it with humor, um, and as as a gamer who's getting a little longer in the tooth, um, I'm not yet I'm not yet 50, but you know, kind of, uh, I think there's a, a cynicism about people and organizations that I I let inform uh, old school wizardry, mm-hmm. and. Uh, that notion that there's the, I even call it the good old boy uh, network at one point in, in the text that, um, well, we, you know, you're sure we want you youngins to, to prosper, but not too much. Um, you know, we, we want innovation, but as long as it's innovation that serves the bottom line and by the bottom line, I mean my bottom line, not yours. Um, it, it really is kind of looking that direction. Um, and, and also the notion that institutions tend to be kind of pretentious so the the e on old that we that we mentioned before, um, and that uh, kind of that sensibility, and, and then it's it's a joke too mm-hmm. to you know OSR and and kind of our um, our older gamer DNA, um, the the and the word school in old school wizardry school also a, a group of wizards who are practicing the same science are referred to as a as a school, and then the the final tweak on it um, is old is a a homophone for one of the potential campaign villains, the old, um, which is a you know my my nod to elves, um, but you know not a not a playable species, but um, but creatures that are that are very alien and generally would not appear on screen. Um, but it's a it's a homophone for old. Mm-hmm. So those all kind of baked in together, um, crystallized and gave us our our title, which I started to step away from at one point in favor of just the nine ancient runes of magic, but on the very good advice of my friend, Russ Wrightson, um, he's like, no, it, it is what it is, man. It, you know, it, it's that through and through. You've, you've got to call it what it is, um, whether people kind of get it or not. So that was, I think that was great advice and I'm, I'm glad I took it. Yeah. Um, I, w- I will admit that the last few times that I've done a magical organization, um, I've I've done I've I've done I've done it with the with the with a bit of a I don't want to say cynical approach but but more of, <laughs> more of a this is this is but but more of ta- more of taking a bit more of taking a magical spin on the on the whole on the whole notion of military intelligence is an oxymoron. Oh, sure. Beca- yeah. Because ev- everybody who's um, served who is brave enough to talk with me. Has told mm-hmm. has told me all has told me no shortage of stories of yes. pe- of people in the military acting like complete idiots or mm-hmm. just stupid thi- just just stupid things that they had to deal with, um, and at the t- and at the time I was watching um in I was watching the thick of it, a uh, okay. which is a really good um drama that was on BBC, okay, and. I fell in love with the character of Ma- of Malcolm Tucker, who was basically the pr- who was basically the um, spin doctor for a um, na- for a nameless political party, and his whole job okay. was basically to clean up everybody else's mess. <laughs> and because of that, he had a very he had a very case of I fucking hate every single one of you, but I'm gonna do my goddamn job. But uh-huh. I'm still going to I'm going to lay it. I'm not going to let you forget that you guys are a bunch of fucking idiots. Right. Um, and that was kind of the approach that I had, t- I had taken where the, um, where the, pl- where the player characters, their, their job was, their job was not, gl- their job was anything but glamorous. They were not heroes to save the day. They <clears throat> were the guy, ga- they were the cleanup crew because somebody else <laughs> screwed up. Yeah. 
Yeah. I love it. And a lot a lot of it com- and I do I do agree with you on the no- on the notion that inserting hu- inserting humor um can certainly can certainly work. Um large largely beca- largely because la- largely because of the power of laughter and also Yeah. Um I remember a, I remember a line that Mel Brooks said when he was describing dark mm-hmm. comedy. Mm-hmm. Tragedy is when I cut my finger. Comedy is when you fall into an open sewer hole and die. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yep. So I think helping us process the banality of, you know, what what can be some pretty frustrating, uh, some pretty frustrating days that we that we live through, mm-hmm. and kind of exercising that through story um not pretending what's stupid isn't stupid and coming together around the table whether you know face to face or virtually um to turn it on its ear and, and laugh about it um you know but before the show started you and i were chatting briefly about you know trying to deal with that anxious winter driver and you know that's that's real right like that's uh that's that's a real point of frustration where somebody else's choices uh, good and bad can really have an impact on, you know, us getting where we want to get to safely. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, uh, you finding, finding the place to to laugh in there, um, is just good medicine, uh, for, for life that can be pretty frustrating. Um, now one of the things I found interesting when it came to the magic system, which, um, you have no idea how how happy I was to to see a to see an old school fantasy game that was not using the that was not using the Vancian model because <laughs> I have never ever 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 liked the whole the whole the whole spells per day shit shit. Mm-hmm. I have at best tolerated it. <laughs> the, the same the same way I tolerate the pain of ripping off a band-aid. Sure. And what I'm curious about is did is the development of the magic system that you get that you're using for old school wizardry. Did it did it start out a bit more traditional and then kind of transformed or went or in the early days of old school wizardry was it a case of the traditional magic system sucks. We need to blow it up and start fresh. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Mildred. Um, when I when I wanted to sit down and pull my players together, um, I had played some third edition. I run a run a game where everybody was a, a different monster defending their collective dungeon complex from um, the predations of invading adventurers. And, and it was, a, it was a comedy game, mm-hmm. um, went really well, but it was just feeling the drag of the, the crunch. Like it was, I was struggling to maintain the tone I wanted to, um, as people were nose down in their character sheets, making sure they got every plus one and plus two and, and getting those nailed down. And it, and it really, I found I was working harder to find the joy. And so I was like, okay, when was when was I feeling joy last? Like when was it just electric? And I ended up looking all the way back to the the Mold Bay um, basic and you know the um, the Cook Era expert and said, okay, I think I just want to start a campaign where everybody's just a first level magic user and we kind of hammer this out and and make this work. Um, and that's and let's let's go that direction. Let's build from there. Now knowing though that I wanted to be able to fill, um, you know, fill a session, fill a four or fill a five hour session, not with the, the five minute dungeon work day, but wanted more dynamism and knowing at the same time, you know, if we're, we're going to come back at this thing, um, <laughs> you're going to laugh me right off the show when I talk about this as a source, but Try um, me. <laughs> wonder twins, wonder twin powers activate do you remember the um oh dear uh, fucking god (laughs) right so like here he goes he he hangs up at this point but uh, (laughs) as insipid as that was um and and that was incredibly insipid oh and don't forget gleek the monkey um i was trying to forget that damn it (laughs) the the idea that the two of them have nothing going 
on their own. But they've got to like they've got to figure out how to put it together, and you know we're we're going to get something that's greater than the sum of its parts. Mm-hmm. Um, now a slightly more palatable echo of that same idea was Voltron, lions, not spaceships. Spaceships was trash, um, but you know so. Um, every episode of Voltron goes exactly the same way. It's basically a ritual, right? You you watch the giant robot lions get their butts kicked individually, mm-hmm. and then one of them finally has the bright idea, hey, let's form Voltron. And they do, and they take on this week's Roe Beast and you know, cut it exactly in half and so forth and so on. Mm-hmm. And it's uh it's very formulaic. But that again, that idea that um and we've got to each one of us commit to doing our parts and get the timing right. And then we're going to be rock stars for the, for the moment. Um, so I, I knew that was exciting to me and I wanted to take that, you know, we've got to come at magic, the nitty gritty of magic as a team, if we're going to get over this hurdle. Um, and, and I wanted to look for a way to press that into a framework that was as dead simple as a Molve basic, um, something that was intuitive for the OSR player. They could they could pick it up and look at. It. And this term, at this point, my my players were just you know my friends and my my circle. So I wanted something where I didn't have to spend a lot of time explaining system to them, and we could just go because we're you know we're working adults. We've got a limited number of uh, of hours in the week for recreation, so. You know, limited amusement with for digging through vast tomes of of rules. So, you know, with that sort of necessity, um, I wanted to see them be able to MacGyver with their magic. Um, I was I was smart enough too to know that limitations are what make things like really interesting. Um, that you know, heroism and and interest comes from uh, bricolage. It comes from taking the thing that was not necessarily meant for that, but turning it around and using it to solve the problem. Um, And again, that's kind of MacGyvering, I guess, is is the way we probably say it now. And so I knew I needed that that element in there. Um, And I just, I couldn't get the Pseudovancian spell slots to quite get there. I couldn't get get it to give me what I was completely looking for. Mm -hmm. And so we we just kind of started grinding at that a little bit um my my friend bob um had talked about you know we we sat on my front porch and kind of banged some ideas back and forth about um well okay maybe you're rolling rolling a die for the action and and you're rolling a die for what you're acting on and you know and he had suggested going with colors of dice, different colors here, different colors there. And it so so like that was an idea that we pushed around, but it never made its way to table. Because um, I didn't want to lose the even the split seconds of a player like, okay, give me two more yellows. And then I want to, di- didn't want to spend that time. Um, so I think it really, to answer your question, it, it emerged from from that. Uh, wanting the the elegance and simplicity of that OSR chassis and adding complexity only where it was really critical to be on theme for the game. Um, a lesson that I learned from King Arthur Pendragon, and I, I mentioned that as like one of my probably big three RPGs that influenced me the very most, is Pendragon, King Arthur Pendragon, is about what it's about. Mm-hmm. It's not about anything else, right? So, <laughs> you know, I want to play an elf, find a different game. The, you know, Pendragon is just about that one thing and it's really really good at emulating at simulating that one literary genre down to like that one or two authors that that really we want to have come to life at the table and so the lesson there was like make this about the one thing and rules that are not about the one thing they need to be so simple as to be a footnote you know just just intuitive or they need to just get the heck out of the way and you know, build your system around the action that you want to see happening at the table the very most. And that was intelligent, fun people leaning around the table and going, okay, we, we got to get this spell together. I'll take you back to um, my latest session. Mm-hmm. We want to get back over this this pond of digestive, digestive acid because, of, of course, at this point, the wizards have been swallowed by a giant 
you know, Dune style worm, why wouldn't they be? And I know they've got to try to navigate their way back across the stomach acid. So, but okay, all I, I can make metal, but how fast is that going to dissolve in the acid? Okay, well, how much of it can you make? Well, I, I can only make a handful. Well, I've got, I've got a formula that lets us make that a larger quantity than that. Okay, but well, how long is it going to last? Well, okay, I, here's what my temporal formula is that's going to govern that aspect of the spell. And so I wanted to create that um, mental imaginative terrarium where smart, funny people lean in together and like solve this problem. They MacGyver their way through a problem. And, you know, and, and maybe that's 10 minutes of table time. Maybe it's an hour and a half. If they're, if they're engaged and, you know, the frontal lobes are, are lighting up like Christmas trees, that's where I want to be. That's the space I want to I really try to maximize. So that's my take. <laughs> and the em the emphasis on co the emphasis on collaboration is something I yeah. find interesting because now I will I will admit that I have a very love hate relationship with the um, with a lot of old with a lot of old school play and just the OSR scene in in general because. Again, I think they, I think they, um, I think there's an emphasis on focusing on the wrong things, and in worst cases, um, romanticizing. I've I've often said that yeah. nostal nostal um, nostalgia is the sweet poison, and I've I like <laughs> I like a certain phrase that John Wick, no, not that one, had had said. Where he said, "We like to cast things in a romantic light, and all us husbands know that shadows do a great job of hiding love handles." <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Smart man, um, but the reason I bring that kind of thing up is the whole the whole idea of co of collaborative action or collaborative spellcasting. If you look at a lot of games, old and new, for as much mm -hmm. as people romanticize about how in the in the good old days it was about collaboration instead of a instead of a bunch of individually powerful people, collaborative actions, whether it be just standard actions, spellcasting, or whatnot have an afterthought kind of attitude where it's mm -hmm. just a slightly modified die roll that you would have done anyways. Right. Whereas you're dedicating a lot more attention to it. And I'm, would it be fair of me to say that that was something that you, that was something that you had noticed and wanted to use old school wizardry to kind of respond to? I think, yes, yes, sir. I think my delight at the table um, came from those MacGyver a team moments uh when we love it when a plan comes together right and it just wanted to create as much of that time uh and and just seed the earth for uh, and encourage the growth of that kind of thinking and that kind of interaction um gosh that was a that was a huge driver um versus you know the, the individual specialist um who just you know kind of hopes that every other member of the team happens to be on that day yeah um mm -hmm. It does. Now, granted, it certainly doesn't certainly doesn't help that, um, unlike a lot of other games, anytime that D and D has tried has tried to utilize skills, it has and always will feel awkward because it was never designed mm -hmm. for them. Yeah, Not the same. And I know so, whenever I bring this kind of thing up, people say, "Well, well, what about the th what about all these skill lists that the thief has? That's just a glorified <laughs> class feature." Mm -hmm. um, right. When I when I say a skill system, I'm think I'm talking about the skill system that you might see in say, Pendragon, the kind of skill system yeah. you might see in Shadowrun, these skill system you might see in RuneQuest, in Call mm -hmm. of Cthulhu, so on. Those are games that have their have their have um skills in their core framework. There, you have in a lot any sort of game that has the whole attribute plus skill formula is gonna have this to a degree and. Yeah. Whenever something like D and D has tried um, tried to integrate skills, especially third edition onward, it's always felt awkward. Right. And the other the other thing that the other thing that I um that I was cu that I was curious about getting back to the getting back to the um sp of the spell system is early early on. Even even with the even with the whole horizontal and vertical approach with spells, was that was there was the in some of the early versions were there attempts to try and ha to try and have spells um be leveled, or was that something that got thrown out quick? 
that was never on the table. Um, that's a good question. I did a um, blog post, kind of a retrospective, um, because here I've got a shelf in the, in the room I'm sitting here now that's got each uh, print copy of each edition, each version, I guess, of, of Old School Wizardry um, from its inception back from when it was about 16 pages um, and you know, pre-art. And uh, yeah, having leveled, leveled spells was never... Uh, a consideration. Now you'll notice that um, in the magical formula mm -hmm. that drive duration of a spell, area of effect of the spell, um, you know those things. Some of those carry more load or cost for the caster, but in terms of in terms of access to those, those those are always you know equally accessible. It's in it, it's it's a level free game, right? So we we stepped away from the idea of character levels. Um, and yeah, that was, that was never really on the table. One of them free to, and I'll say along with that, the idea of spell burn, um, was always on the table too. Uh, the notion of you want to gamble, you, you want to push it further. You want to push it further than you should. You want to have enough rope to hang yourself <laughs> with, because again, <laughs> back to your, back to your Mel Brooks, I think that's hilarious. Uh, you know, um, many, many, I've got a folder of, uh, of deceased PCs, um, old school wizardry PCs, and the vast majority of them, it's 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 friendly fire or it's pushing things just further than they reasonably should have. It's not uh, it's not the bad guys that get them; it's their own hubris, which in my mind like really crystallizes um, what what it would be like to be a wizard or most people's egos uh, dressed up in. Hey, I've got some powers now. Just how far am I going to press this? Um, and, and there's probably some Call of Cthulhu there in my in my DNA too, mm -hmm. um, which is not to say that uh, we we run a, a meat grinder. We certainly have uh, folks in game now that are that are more than seventy uh, sessions old. But um, yeah, wizards usually bring about their own doom. <laughs> um, so, and I'm pretty I'm. I've had I've had my I have my own shares of insanity when it comes when it comes to the table. One of them is the one of them is the fact that on the wall I have a I have a list that's called the rules of combat that they don't teach you. Um, one of them be one of them being the only thing more accurate than incoming enemy fire is incoming friendly fire. <laughs> yeah. Um, tracers work both ways. Never uh -huh. share a foxhole with anyone braver than you. Okay. <laughs> Intelligence is always wrong and. Mm -hmm. I and I will I will admit I am ve and it, this applies just as well to magic as it does with tech or anything else. I love yep. giving my players powerful but wildly unsafe <laughs> weaponry. And my this is one of those cases where you might laugh at my at, my, at one of my inspirations for or rather one of my benchmarks for this uh -huh. kind of motif and that is the noisy cricket gun from oh, no. Men in Black. Uh-huh. Yep. You know, really powerful <laughs> sonic blast, but every time you fire it, you get knocked 20 yards. Uh -huh. Yep. I had, uh, I mentioned Russ before. Mm -hmm. um, he was, uh, he's, he's an avid gamer, mm -hmm. and um, he was describing after years of play um, his sense that uh, he, he was still dropping whales from the sky. <laughs> you know, it was, it was just sort of like, what's my level of precision? And that any given casting, um, you know, he knew that things could go horribly wrong, um, even after he'd been, you know, playing his primary character for for years. Um, that sense of I can, I, I've got this, you know, bazooka. Uh, I can get a little more precise with the bazooka. I can get bigger with a bazooka, but I still have a bazooka. When it comes time to cut my steak, I have a bazooka. Um, when my friend is choking on his steak, I have a bazooka, and you know how am I gonna, how am I gonna make that work? And and needing to engage really creatively around that, you know, all right? If I shoot the neighbor's house with my bazooka, maybe some of the shingles flying off will strike enough of the wall that it'll collapse and hit my friend in the back, and will Rube Goldberg that chunk of half chewed steak right out of his uh, his throat there? Um, that kind of that kind of thinking. Um, is is spot on. So yeah, I'm glad you recognize that. Um, it's it's a little tricky to quantify 
uh, characters in the old school wizard to say, well, oh, they're they're powerful. Oh, they're too powerful. They're overpowered. They're underpowered, right? Because it's um, or, or almost Star Trek, right? The the phaser goes all the way up to um, super incinerate. Um, it, it doesn't mean that the judgment of the guy holding the phaser is any better, um, <laughs> you know. So uh, that that really clicks. I hear what you're saying. I like the foxhole one too. I had not heard that before. Yeah, th- there's there's like, a sh- <laughs> um, and of course, and of course, I have I have the unwritten rule of um, if any if anybody gets if anybody gets caught cheating, they have to drink from the pane glass. Oof. <laughs> um, it is. All that is is just a shot glass fi- filled with um, filled with like five different hot sauces, a little bit a little bit of um, salt, a little bit of sea salt, vinegar, and ground up jalapeno seeds. <laughs> because I, I, it is designed to create pain. Yeah, you might not want to let that secret leak out. Just uh, just keep calling it the pain glass, and I think it'll it'll wax large in their imagination. Um, <laughs> I don't. Everybody at the ta- everybody at the table and th- and those beyond it already know what already know what's in it because a few because a few <laughs> people had to dr- have had to drink the thing when they oh. either um got when they either got caught fudging rolls or they or they tried pulling something really 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 stupid that al- that <laughs> almost um almost caused almost caused a TPK um mm-hmm. and one person tried there was one instance where someone viol- where someone violated the table rule and thought and thought that because a die rolled a natural twenty on the floor that it should count as a natural twenty and I'm like no, if it didn't happen <laughs> on the table I if I if I don't see it on the table it didn't happen. <laughs> but when it com- now when it when it comes to the, when it comes to the um long for- the long form aspects of um, the of old school wizardry. Mm-hmm. What gave you the idea for doing the epilogue mechanic that you guys have? Oh, the Doom of Wizards. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, gosh, I'm glad you came back to that question. So I mentioned uh, the second role playing campaign I'd ever had at, uh, with my my mom as the DM, and uh, it's kind of haunted me to this day because her hook, her setup, um, was that. Uh, she had a very medieval kind of world. Uh, she read Dragon Riders of Pern, mm-hmm. um, also had us steeped in Tolkien, but um, Robin Hood, Tales of Robin Hood and his Merry Men along with that. And so uh, there was a crime um, that our elders had been accused of, but because of the prominence of, of social rank and things, um, you know, evidence wasn't all that important. What mattered was that our elders had been accused and they were going to be held over for trial and they were going to be hanged. Um, and so the clock was really ticking and it was up to us to go and clear their names. And um, so that was, you know, that sounds pretty simple. Um, but for, for me as a youngster, like that urgency of, oh, the, the weight of um, – my authority figures, the weight of the weight of my parents is resting on my shoulders. And we played a couple sessions and we never got to the end of the session. And so I never had resolved um, whether we were able to save them or not, uh, or whether they danced at the end of a rope, never knew. And that kind of, that stayed with me. And then as I ran uh, campaigns in junior high school and then over in high school, you'd have, you know, a good buddy, a good friend. I'm thinking about uh, Joel Meadows, who I, I gamed with in elementary school, and then he stuck with our group through high school. Um, but interests and work schedules and things kind of carried uh, good old Joel away. And so, you know, he didn't really stay with us, with us through the end of the, the campaign. Um, other players were able to. Uh, college kind of intervened. And, and the story just becomes frayed like a rope, right? It, it just kind of gets thinner and some pieces begin to break off. And as uh, my friend, John Disco says, I'm, I'm completely addicted to story. Like story is just core to my heartbeat. I can't get enough of it. And the notion of story unresolved, um, I find it just deeply unsettling, if not upsetting, um, that we've got a character and an arc that we've, we've sat around and developed together through play, but that it would just kind of peter out and die in a whimper um, that it would just sort of go neglected because we're talking about some of the best moments of 
our lives. And, and uh, you know, Mildred, if you've been lucky enough to have the experience I've had, some of your um, your best friendship moments have been sitting around a table, rolling some funny plastic dice, and just laughing your tail off with people who you thought you had, like you didn't dream that you had other people in the world that had that much in common with you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and like, that's, that's just some really heady stuff and, um, not wanting to let that completely go without an epilogue, um, just hurts my heart. And so I took a trick, I borrowed a trick from King Arthur Pendragon, which again, in my top three all time favorite games. And I understand Traveler does this too. And, and again, don't throw me off the show, but I've never played Traveler. I've I've never held a traveler book in my hand and I've never cracked a cover, but I but I understand that Traveler does something similar to what Pendragon does, where you make a series of of dice rolls prior to beginning play to determine what your character's background and backstory is and, and what makes her or him tick and you know what do they like, what they hate, what are their skills, what backgrounds, interests, and um, that that kind of gets developed through a series of of dice rolls. Uh, I'm thinking about the the Great Pendragon campaign. Um, you know, where you start off as as a, uh, an enemy of the Saxons and kind of develop from there. And you you can find out like which of your relatives are alive, which are still dead. I understand that from Traveler, you can actually die in character generation, which I think is fantastic. Um, I I wanted to borrow that same trick and place it at the end of a character's story. So. Um, I've I've got a friend Aaron Smith, um, wonderful human being, really really smart guy. Um, he gets some some shout outs and nods in the book. Um, job and family and things carried him out of our circle where he's he's moved down to Florida now, so he's he's a long long ways away. Um, but his his story and the characters he animated, we didn't want to leave their stories unfinished, just kind of petering out to a whimper. And so in the Doom of Wizards is an epilogue um, series of charts, an epilogue chapter within the book where we took his character and we could walk through, given what he'd achieved so far, um, a series of die rolls that would tell a short story. And that short story would give us the ultimate fate or doom of his particular character and, and kind of really kind of wrap it up. And for better, or for worse, uh, we would we would know the what Paul Harvey to really date myself there would call the rest of the story. Um, we would know how that finished out, uh, and we've we've utilized that each time we've got a player who swings in or out of our circle that we have to say goodbye to. And I and I mentioned right in the book, you know, sometimes it's a promotion at work. Sometimes the new baby is going to arrive, and you know priorities shift. And sometimes it's 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 something. Else. Sometimes the college term is over. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we use the same mechanic. Um, <laughs> so how do we help Jarrett through his grieving? <laughs> right? It's very personal. But but on, on the other hand, we use that um, that same mechanic to keep old school wizardry about what it is about. Uh, and what it is about is it's about these novice neophyte bumbling wizards trying to claw their way to the top and find their place in a, in a big uncaring world where uh, the, their seniors have got things, opportunities locked down tight, um, how to shove their way in there. And so when a character really does start to hit um, a high level of competence, and I don't mean level in the, in the leveling a character sense, but um, where they're really shaping reality without potentially blowing their brain out their ear, turning themselves purple, levitating, petrifying themselves, all of which are possible in the rules. Uh, with Without money, many odds of that, they're able to kind of knock things down without needing their friends, without needing the group around them to help them with the cooperative casting. The net characters begin to track outside of what the focus of the game is about. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a win condition. And when that character achieves enough prestige, there's a game mechanic for calculating prestige. It's pretty pretty simple. That character also goes to the epilogue, also goes to the Doom of Wizards, and we find out what the rest of his story is. Um, and in some cases, it allows the player to go ahead and, and shape aspects of the campaign world um, to make assertions about the campaign world because that 
character is effectively one. You know, we always sit around saying, well, you, you can't win a role playing game, right? That's, <laughs> that's one of those early, early lessons that, that people like to put into their rule sets. You can win old school wizardry. It, <laughs> you know, you, you can't, you can, uh, you can hit a result that um, achieves uh, in world immortality for your, your character yeah. in one way or another. Yep. And for what it's worth, that whole, oh, you can't win, you can't win at a role playing game. I always respond to I always respond to that with what if what if we want to, <laughs> right? Uh, and this that's not this that's not to say I that's not to say I'm some hyper competitive guy who wants to do that kind of thing. It's more of a reflection of the fact that I feel that the, I feel that there you shouldn't close off potential avenues for storytelling because. Mm -hmm. Let's let's say that let's say that somebody wants to do some fantasy version of of um of ba of battle royale or something like that. I mean, hell, mm -hmm. ba in the early, in the early two thousands, there was the there was that satir there was that satirical take on a dungeon game show called X Crawl that was completely oh, yeah. fucking nuts, and I loved it. So why why not go com why not, why not embrace that particular um competitiveness um. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, when, when D, when I remember balking at the whole D and D sports thing, I, okay. came, I um whipped together the whole idea of saying, hey, wh why don't we use the whole idea of gladiator stables and just go through, just go through with it, mm -hmm. treat it, treat it like a well sport, yeah, draft, drafting and analytics and all. I mean, we already do. I mean, fantasy football is just is just D and D for people who don't <laughs> want to admit it. So why not, so why not embrace that? <laughs> uh, that's good. Yeah, but when now when it come when now I know th I know that there that there was a certain page size with the uh, document that you that you sent me. Um, do you see do you see that page size increasing after after the Kickstarter, or do you see it more or less set as it as it currently is? I don't see um, that growing in the near future. Um, it's it's 376 pages right now, um, and that's that's a lot of nights and and weekends and start and stop. Um, as a, so, as a public school teacher, I'm catching that between grading papers at at home and um, kind of piecing it in. And you know, this this is the game as we've been playing it for eight years. Um, and it's it's kind of this has grown very organically out of what we've been doing. Um, I think some of my hopes for the future. Uh, I mentioned my friend Aaron before. Um, he helped us with the development and systemization of uh, a character generation arc on the front end. Again, with a nod towards Pendragon, where um, you could take the character through what his college course load was at the Collegium Mysterium. And based on how well he did, and which classes he was able to get and not able to get, and choices made by the characters, and a lot of choices made by the dice, um, you, you could you know have that baked character pop out as a neophyte wizard. So uh, we we may explore that a little bit. I realize that's not going to be everybody's cup of tea, um, and that's that's largely developed. But it, it'll be kind of a wait and see with that. Um, I just having something that I care about out in the wider world is is immensely gratifying so i'm still in the in the glow <laughs> right there along with with josh he's just uh the other half of our of our team he's just been a hero all the way through this and i really should have said more about josh up up until this point and i regret having not um but we wouldn't be anywhere near where we are we, we wouldn't be uh without what josh has, was has put in continually with it um he's he's been uh the editor layout um, helped us out with figuring out how the art communicates with the text. He's an absolute whiz at finding the right image to, to kind of buff and supplement. And he's talked me up through this whole thing, um, just reaffirming over and over, yeah, there's, there's something worth taking a look at here. Uh, this could have some legs beyond your back room, beyond your little table. And without that encouragement, without that vision, um, you know, we'd, we'd still be happily playing. Uh, we played the other night. We're going to play Friday. And um, we're not going to stop anytime soon. But, you know, his recognition that it could it could spread out into the bigger world um, has just been immense. 
So, and is savvy for communication too. Um, you know, I, we certainly wouldn't be talking tonight if Josh hadn't figured out how to find some voice and, uh, he's, he's just excellent with that. Um, so really, really, uh, glad that I could partner up with somebody who could make this thing go. And okay. This, this question might sound a bit stupid, but when it comes, but when it comes to the whole partnering up, um, which one to use the Abbott and which one to use the Costello? <laughs> <laughs> wow. How would, how would he answer that? That's what I want to, um, gosh, uh, you know, I feel like we would, we, we've never had creative disputes or differences, but I feel like if you put that question to us, it, it might actually foment our, our first serious conflict. <laughs> you know, we, we'd, we'd both, we'd both probably want to be the, uh, the straight man, right? Because the, the straight man has the harder comedic load, um, <laughs> you know, as he's, as he's playing off the buffoon, but we would both secretly suspect that we were the buffoon. So I, I don't know that I can answer that one in a satisfactory way. Um, for, for fear of ruining a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and to be fair, to be fair, this isn't the first time I've asked this kind of question. It's just that there's, <laughs> al there's, al there's always, there's always that kind, there's always that kind of dynamic when it comes, when it comes sure. to people bouncing ideas, ba bouncing ideas back and forth. And I'm just as guilty about, about it with as anyone <laughs> else is. But when now for now, um, with that said, I do want to I do want to take this time to congratulate you you guys for completely completely um smashing the initial goal that you ha that you guys had. Thanks. Um you guys were only asking for like five, 500 bucks and you're at and you're at 6.6000 at the time of this recording. Oh, wow. Okay. Um now once now the Kickstarter at the time of this recording has nine days to go, and once that's fin once that's all wrapped up and the paperwork is all dealt with because of how these things work, yep. What are you shooting for as far as a release window for old school wizardry? Yep, I don't want to I don't want to talk ahead of um, Josh on this one, and uh, mm -hmm. it, it would definitely be something I would would refer to him to nail a date. Um, you know, our, our highest priority, Mildred, is making sure that we take care of our Kickstarter backers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what what kind of sets us apart is that I'm holding a copy of the book in my hand right now, right? So mm -hmm. the art is done, the layout is done, the writing is done, the editing is done. Um, it's, it's at the printer. Um, so getting those copies of the books into the hands of our backers, and in the case of the folks who... Um, uh, went to the higher tier, uh, getting my artwork in the mail to them, my original artwork in the mail to them, um, is, is the highest priority. And then once those are moving, uh, then we look to just shift right over to a print on demand, uh, promoted through the Facebook page. Um, so that's, that's, you know, kind of flip the switch, I guess is, is the answer. Mm -hmm. If I, if I had to make a guess, and this is me watching, um, how fast or slow the print copies, some of the advanced copies that I've got are moving right now through the printer. Um, I would guess February that we go to print on demand online sales. Um, so I would be guess the beginning of February uh, when somebody who was not able to get a shot at the Kickstarter um, can get back in and get a, and get a shot. Cause we certainly don't want to create a situation where, uh, you know, one of our backers is is seeing products move um, through online orders, and and they're still waiting. Um, that's just not doing right by, not doing right by them. All right, I can I can I can definitely see I can definitely see that, and I will be I will personally be looking forward to how that how that develops. And and since I don't want to jinx or attract the attention of the irony gods, <laughs> I know some I know some people might say, "Isn't that a little bit too much super superstitious?" Um, game gamers are gamers and sports fans alike have plen have plenty of superstition. I mean, you're, <laughs> you're not going to be touching anybody else's dice, are you? Dice, yeah. No, I know. Don't touch the dice. Mm -hmm. Um. Besides, in my case, somebody did do that, and the first roll they did was a natural one. So, oh. 
Oof. Th thanks for thanks for validate thanks for validating my belief that you don't do that unless you want it unless you want <laughs> cursed rolls. Did that die have to meet Thor's hammer then? Was that uh Um We should we um <laughs> Well does the does does a potato gun count? <laughs> I, I think the net result is the same. Yeah. But with that, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play. <laughs> um, and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, Mildred, thank you for having me. It's uh, It's been a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And... Um... Gosh, I, I look forward to hearing back from your experiences with the old school wizardry mm -hmm. and the uh, the hijinks that you get up to. Yeah. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay! Fucking frosty, everybody.